Leviathan Wakes is the first novel in what would become known as the Expanse series, the books that the sci-fi series is loosely based upon. Written by Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank under the pen name of James S. A. Corey, over these five parts we'll be taking a look at the events and delving into them. So with that, let's begin. The prologue begins with Julie Mao and tells of how she's been locked for eight days in a storage locker, unable to make any noise for fear of being shot. Her ship, the Scopuli, was boarded, and when she offered resistance, was tossed in with that warning. After those eight days, she is ready to be shot, especially having heard what she thinks is the sound of her shipmates being beaten and tortured. Except when she does finally exit, no one is there to stop her. Only a tremendous thing where she sees her captain's head pleading with her to help me. It might have been a good thing that she had nothing to eat, because if she had, that sight would have sent it out one direction or the other. The book slowly introduces us to the setting of the story. It's set a few centuries in the future, but not so distant that FTL travel exists. So all activity is limited to our own solar system. Mars and the moon had both been colonized for some time when... In the midst of near war between Earth and Mars, a new fusion drive called the Epstein Drive was invented that allowed practical use of that part of the solar system that was beyond Mars. In that rather short period of time, keep in mind that while 150 years sounds like a long time, that as of the time that this video was released, 150 years ago was the beginning of the transition between feudal and modern Japan, Slavery in America was abolished, and the very first plastic was invented. In the solar system of the future, that amount of time allowed for a furious expansion into the asteroid belt and the outer planets, a total of about 50 million people. In keeping with the historical lessons about colonialism, this expansion was not equitable for everyone involved. The inner planets would support the settlement of asteroids and moons by sending the ships out, along with the resources needed to get them going, but ultimately this situation would be exploited. The population in the belt, as it was often referred to, even though it also included the rest of the solar system beyond the asteroid belt, were expected to be a cheap labor force as well as consumers of Earth and Martian products. Thus the inner planets provide the capital, the belters provide the labor, but the inner planets were the ones benefiting far more with this arrangement. They were the ones in control. Thanks to crony capitalism, that meant society would favor their corporate overlords over the belters. As a result, there were effectively three alignments. Martians, Earth, with the moon alongside them, and the outer planets. While the outer planets were under the control of those corporations, and thus had no official say, a movement within them called the Outer Planet Alliance, or OPA, existed to try to remedy that. So in practice, being aware of what the OPA might be doing was always an issue. Earth had the biggest fleet, Mars had the most advanced fleet, and the OPA had nothing to lose. Thus in this story, where all the events are set in the outer planets, the strained relationship between the belters and the inner planets is most emphasized. However much Earth and Mars may mistrust each other, the mistrust the belters had for both is much greater. Belters can tell who is and who is not a belter because, with no artificial gravity, only simulated gravity such as with rotation, they have builds that are much taller and thinner than those who grew up down the gravity well, as they see it. By the same token, the view of the belters as a kind of subhuman species is typical of those back on the planets, as the rich often view the lower class. The physical difference makes this even easier for the arrogant to justify their behavior to themselves. We see these events from the point of view of two men, Holden, an earther working a ship mostly full of belters, and Miller, a cop working on Ceres Station, an important port in the asteroid belt. The two situations are very different, though. While Holden is the exo of his ship despite being an earther, Miller's earther partner, Havelock is the victim of anti-Earth prejudice within his department, and it is impossible for him to overcome it. But the big difference probably lies in the nature of the ship, a former colony ship turned ice hauler bringing glaciers from Saturn to the colonies. The crew is more accepting because generally it's composed of rejects, those who are either incompetent, have personality issues, 
or have something in their past preventing them from passing a background check for a job that they are qualified for. Holden, for instance, was dishonorably discharged from the military. It's not really surprising, then, that the name of their ship is the Canterbury. As much like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, they are quite an odd assemblage of people. Uh, the fact that Canterbury Tales has a character who's the Miller is probably a coincidence, but an amusing one. The Canterbury comes across a distress signal from Julie's ship, the Scopuli. The Scopuli's registry says it's Martian. That might be faked. There are several scopuli on Mars, such as the Borealis scopuli near the North Pole of that planet, but given that the Canterbury is forced to investigate only for there to be a disaster, the name in the context of the story is far more appropriate when one recalls that in Greek mythology, the rocks that the sirens perched upon while drawing sailors to their deaths were called scopuli. The investigation by Holden and the four crew members joining him shows no sign of Julie or the thing that she had seen, only questions, like why the reactor was shut down and every door in the place opened, and why there's a distress beacon if nobody's there to be rescued. The answer is revealed when they find the beacon and see it's not the ship's own, but a beacon that someone has rigged up to draw a ship in and then alert whoever sent it that someone had arrived. Sure enough, before the five can get back to the Canterbury, it's being pursued by unknown ships, presumably pirates. Holden's group does their best to return in time to either interfere with the attack or barter for the release of the crew and maybe even the ship. But to everyone's shock and horror, the pirates launch a nuke to destroy the Canterbury. This, as Holden notes, makes no sense. As he keeps asking, who gets paid? In other words, what possible motive is there to destroy an ice hauler, cargo included? There's nothing gained. In fact, you're down the cost of a hard-to-get nuke. All he knows is that the beacon that they have has a Martian serial number on it. So he sends out a wide-band signal of all the facts, including that little detail. Well, that draws a bit of attention. When the company calls up, they're livid that he openly accused Mars of destroying the Canterbury. Holden insists that he didn't, but no one sees it as anything more than a fig leaf to cover himself. They're instructed to cooperate with the Martians by rendezvousing with their flagship, the warship Doniger, the name derived from an old Germanic reference to the god Thor, in case you weren't sure if it was a badass. Worried they're going to be disappeared inside of the Doniger, Holden and the crew send out another wideband transmission announcing their intent to rendezvous hoping that news getting around will ensure that Mars won't, uh, well, lock them away and torture them. Contact them along the way is Fred Johnson. He was formerly a decorated war hero who, after being forced to command a raid to reclaim a station after 170 armed belters killed the governor and made demands about the price of oxygen, well, Johnson resigned and devoted himself to bringing justice to the belt. An open, high-ranking OPA member, he adds legitimacy by being both a public figure moved by the mistreatment of the Belters and because of his devotion to a peaceful resolution whenever possible, rather than open warfare. A fact that no one would really ever win a war like that, given what would be lost in the process. He tells Holden that if he's not being coerced in his next public statement to use the word ubiquitous, so they can spread word about whether or not the Martians are trying to cover things up. Over on Ceres, now a station of six million people, under a governor from Earth with a police force that's really just hired corporate security, Miller does his best to get from one day to the next. Two things he mentions sums up the situation on Ceres. One, it doesn't have laws, it just has police. And also, his job is not to uphold the law, is to stop Ceres from falling apart. And yet, he can't help but notice that something is weird around here. When a crook steps into the territory of another gang, there's no reprisal. In fact, there's a sign that a lot of the major gangs here have pulled up stakes. But despite the absence of criminals, the OPA is still a regular presence here, which is a real problem when that broadcast from Holden is heard. The result, as predicted, is outrage. Leaving aside that a Belter ship was seemingly destroyed by Mars, Miller explains to Havelock how serious this is from the perspective of a Belter. 
losing out on a huge ice delivery is very bad. Sure, there's no danger of running out of water anytime soon, but that big block of H2O represents hydrogen fuel and oxygen to breathe. Not taking environmental systems seriously is a fast track to getting roughed up or killed out in the belt. When there was a case of someone who didn't clean the air filters in apartments that he rented was murdered, the cops just wrote it off as an unsolved without even bothering to investigate. The guy had it coming. So to the belters, this was a first the insult, then the injury situation. Destroy one of their ships and waste cargo vital to better their lives. As predicted, belters start lashing out, and the problem for the cops is that someone stole all the riot gear out of storage. Now this makes no sense either, as the swap material is still there, and that would be a lot more useful to people than riot gear, which is only meant to intimidate crowds, not really hurt anybody. This means that, when they see a man murder a Martian, that in the end Miller has no choice but to shoot out his kneecaps in order to stop him, while having to use words to rein in the crowd, pointing out that each belter taken out through infighting is one less belter to resist Earth or Mars if the inevitable happens. But distracting him is a case that the Force Captain gave him on the side, Julie Maus. Her father, a big-shot corporate type back on the moon, wants her found and returned against her will, something that apparently happens often enough to be commonly referred to as a kidnap job. The presumption is that Juliet, as her parents refer to her, is just a rebellious young adult out here proving she doesn't need her parents' money by wallowing in the cause of the downtrodden, who will probably fold the first time things get difficult. His opinion rapidly changes, though, when he goes to her quarters, seeing she lives a Spartan lifestyle and resists attempts by her parents to blackmail her into coming home by threatening to sell off the Razorback, her racing yacht. He notes she's got belts in self-defense classes, legitimate ones, not the kind that you see in strip malls. Julia Mao isn't just a runaway rich girl. She's deliberately severing ties with her roots, and Miller is impressed. But what shocks him is a final warning from her father that something very, very bad was coming to the belt soon and she needed to come home. Given the timing with the destruction of the Canterbury, it strongly suggests to Miller that Mr. Mao knew something about the Scopuli long before the Canterbury ever showed up. In the next part, we see how much deeper the rabbit hole seems to go as Holden and Miller look for the truth. 